Hello everybody. This is the first part of your series of lectures on occlusion. There are a total of three lectures. All these lectures are meant for the undergraduate students. They are very simple and very basic. And since it's not possible to imagine everything, therefore all the concepts have been explained with help of diagrams and photographs. I hope you find them interesting and you enjoy them. So let's go ahead with the first one. We study occlusion in conservative, in prosthetics, in orthodontics, periodontics, and other subjects. Therefore, the subject of occlusion is such that it forms a medium to bring all the branches of dentistry together. Hence, whenever we talk of occlusion, we should view it in a cohesive and a comprehensive manner. Now, what is occlusion? Basically, and very simply putting, it describes the contact relationship of teeth in function or parafunction. Angle defined occlusion as the normal relation of the occlusal inclined planes of teeth when the jaws are closed. Occlusion is not just about teeth. It involves the entire stomatogonathic system. We have to develop the understanding of the interrelationship between our teeth, the periodontal structures, bones, joints, muscles and nervous system during the full range of mandibular movements. That means when we talk of occlusion, we don't talk of teeth, but we talk about all these structures in motion together. Coming to biomechanical systems. What are biomechanical systems? It basically means studying the mechanical aspects of a biological system in terms of its structure, function and motion. And in our mouth, the structures involved are the temporomandibular joints, muscles and teeth in terms of occlusion. So all these three interconnected systems are studied together. During restorative procedure, it is important for every student to have knowledge of the acceptable contact relationship, the techniques required to produce these relationships, and to check whether they have been accurately reproduced and to correct if not so, and finally to know the harmful effects which can be produced if they are left uncorrected. The restorative dentistry loses its significance when it's unable to develop a good occlusion. What does a healthy mouth require? It requires stable occlusion relationship to help in efficient mastication. You see we have teeth in our mouth. It what comes to our mind first. We need these teeth to eat. So we require stable occlusal relationship to help in efficient mastication. Then to maintain the vertical dimension of the face. It provides stability to the arches and it protects the soft tissues, which means our tongue, our gingiva, the buccal mucosa, all those things. What can be the adverse effects of faulty occlusion? Most commonly, it is the tooth wear and mobility. Mobility results if we, the tooth wear stays uncorrected due to imbalanced forces acting on the teeth. Definitely, the restorations would be damaged and if the forces are high, it can even lead to cracking of the teeth. How about the effect on the TMJ? These unbalanced forces can lead to joint pain, clicking and even degenerative joint diseases. Now, since so much of unbalanced forces are present, the muscles will definitely be in tension. This can result in myofascial pain. And if all this stays uncorrected, it can result in continuous headaches. Now, our mind is trained to see what it believes. So it becomes very important to believe in the right concepts. And we begin from the very beginning, that is a functional occlusal anatomy. You can easily see that the maxillary dental arch is larger and wider than the mandibular dental arch. This results in the maxillary teeth overlapping the mandibular teeth when the jaws are closed. Now the relationship of the teeth within each arch, that is these two teeth, is called the intra-arch relation, intra-arch relationship. Whereas the relationship of the teeth of the two arches 
is the inter arch relationship coming to the anterior teeth the occlusion of the anterior teeth when the jaws are closed during maximum intercuspation we see that the anterior teeth they overlap the maxillary ones are overlapping the mandibular teeth with light or no contact now the influence of the mandibular movement due to the relative overlap of the anterior teeth is known as the anterior guidance which is being done by the anterior teeth now we see that during normal intercuspation the maxillary teeth are overlapping mandibular making light or no contact the lingual surfaces of the maxillary incisor that is here these surfaces they provide incisal guidance for the mandibular teeth in opening and protrusive movements coming to overjet and overbite the horizontal overlap of the teeth is called the overjet where does it how do we measure it it is measured from the labial surface of the mandibular incisor that means from here till the incisal edge of the maxillary central incisor it's normally 2 to 3 mm coming to overbite it is the vertical overlap of the teeth and it is normally 2 to 3 mm you can also express it in percentage so like 30 to 40% now if the overlap is greater than 40% it is considered to be a deep bite occlusion of the posterior teeth during maximal intercuspation it is observed that the mandibular buccal cusps they coincide with the maxillary central fossa during maximum intercuspation you can see that the mandibular buccal cusps these ones are coinciding with the maxillary central fossa here similarly the maxillary lingual cusps are coinciding with the mandibular central fossa if we join a line connecting all the mandibular buccal cusps it will coincide with a line connecting all the maxillary central fossas and the vice versa this line is called mandibular buccal occlusal line till now we talked about the maxillary and the mandibular arc on whole coming down to individual teeth a unit of occlusion is a cusp in a fossa in a tooth there are two types of cusps the stamp cusps which are these and the non supporting cusps which are these now the stamp cusps are also called supporting centric or holding cusps whereas the non supporting cusps they are also called shearing guiding or non centric cusps the difference between the supporting and the non supporting cusp it is very clearly depicted in the diagram the supporting cusps they are larger broader more rounded and they occupied 2/3 of the facial lingual width which is about 60% whereas the non supporting cusps they are sharper and smaller and they occupy 1/3 of the facial lingual width which is 40% you can see that the supporting cusps they contact the opposing tooth during intercuspation here whereas the non supporting cusp they overlap the tooth during intercuspation the supporting cusp they are more closer to the midline if this is the midline whereas the non supporting cusps they are farther away from the midline supporting cusps since they are larger broader and they are in contact with the opposing fossa so obviously they help in crushing of the tooth during mastication in an action similar to mortar and pestle also they help to maintain the vertical dimension of the face and since they are contacting each other each other and they interdigitating each other therefore they prevent the drifting of the teeth also they prevent the passive eruption of the tooth whereas the non supporting cusps they help in shearing of the tooth 
and another function that they perform which is very important is that they protect this overlap of theirs protects the soft tissues of the buccal mucosa and the tongue from getting trapped between the teeth during biting or chewing so when you make a faulty restoration in a patient's mouth invariably he'll come back and say that i'm constantly biting my cheek or my tongue so that's why it's very important to reproduce these relations cusp fossa occlusal relation or tooth to tooth relation in this relation the tooth the cusp of one tooth occludes with the fossa of single opposing tooth as seen here also cusp of this tooth is opposing with this fossa in cusp ridge occlusal relationship it is also called tooth to two teeth contact or cusp embrasure relationship here you can see that if we come to this diagram the cusp of stamp cusp of this tooth occludes with the fossa of the opposing tooth whereas this stamp cusp is occluding with the embrasure formed by the marginal ridges of two adjacent teeth in the first diagram you can see this cusp is occluding with the marginal ridges in the embrasure area by the of the marginal formed by the marginal ridges of two opposing teeth it is the most stable relationship tripodization in a complete closure in a normal young mouth the contact point of the supporting cusp is neither at the very cusp nor it is a single point in now if you see this first cusp that is s1 here it is contacting the opposing tooth at three points point a b and c now these three contacts are occurring on the inclines of the cusps and they are called tripoid contacts this phenomenon is called tripodization for the cusp s2 you can see this cusps the contact is at the point b c and d so these are the tripoid contacts in the first diagram we can see that the restoration is nicely carved showing tripoid contacts here here and here whereas in this diagram there is a complete surface contact and this cusp impinges onto this restoration therefore the forces of occlusion will cause wearing away of the restoration and damage to it also cause wearing away of the tooth structure mastication is not just the grinding process produced by rubbing together of teeth it occurs by the crushing action of the supporting cusps against their opposing fossa in association with the ridges of non supporting cusps without actual tooth contact i decided to classify occlusion towards the end of this presentation only after i had explained the importance of different cusps occluding in the opposing fossa In 1899 Edward Angle introduced a single system of classification of malocclusions based on the mesiodistal relationship of teeth, dental arches and the jaws. He fixed the first permanent molar as the key point. Now based on the lower first molar deviation in relation to the upper first permanent molar he classified malocclusions as class 1, class 2 and class 3. these are the three classifications the first one is the class 1 the second one is class 2 malocclusion in this you can see that the mandible has moved backwards and it occurs in the condition when the mandible is deficient small in size or it is retruded this first molar has moved backwards as compared to the upper first molar which has been fixed as the key point next is the class 3 here you see that the mandibular molar has moved forwards this occurs in the condition when the mandible is enlarged it is protruded forwards so it is the class 3 malocclusion 
class 1 no occlusion or the normal occlusion in this type of occlusion the mesiopuccal cusp of the permanent maxillary first molar occludes with the mesiopuccal groove of the mandibular first molar class 2 or the disto occlusion in this type of occlusion the mesiopuccal cusp of the permanent maxillary first molar occludes with the facial embrasure between the mandibular first molar and the mandibular second premolar it occurs due to slight posterior positioning of the mandible class 3 or mesial occlusion this results when there is forward positioning of the mandible with respect to the maxilla this leads to the mesiobuccal cusp of the maxillary first molar to occlude with the distobuccal groove of the mandibular first molar. The data in this presentation has been taken from the textbook of operative dentistry by Sumita Sandhu. You can read the chapter on occlusion and have a better understanding of the subject. I hope you like this presentation. Thank you.